The Other Side of the Sun by Madeleine Lincoln. 2 5. The lights of the cottage, the lights of the cottage disappeared behind a dune. Moonlight drenched the beach. The arm of the light ship, swinging protectively against the ocean, was dimmed by the brilliance of the night. <clears throat> Ma'am! I stopped, looked around, and saw only a shadow beside a palm tree atop a dune. The shadow moved, revealed itself to be a woman, tall, slender, graceful. She ran lightly down the dune, across the sand, and stood facing me. An odor came with her. An odd mingling of herbs and spices. Neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Mrs. Renier. Yes. She held her hands out to me, smiling. In the moonlight, she was incredibly beautiful, and I understood for the first time that the freshness of youth cannot hope to compete with the beauty of maturity. I had no idea how old she was. I only knew that I was callow and uninformed, and unformed in comparison. I held my hand toward hers, but she drew me to her in a quick and unexpected embrace. I was both surprised and touched. Welcome, she said. I am Belle. Good evening. I slid my hand out of hers. I'm happy to meet you. How did you know? Everybody at the beach knowed the new Mrs. Renier was coming. Everybody know Belle. Everybody know Belle Zunneman and her boys. Except me, I said. The moonlight touched her delicate features, glanced off her dark skin. The rising breeze whipped her skirts about her long thighs. Her skirts were considerably shorter than mine and revealed her feet and ankles. She wore a lace bodice, gypsy style, but she had a delicacy in the darkness I had never seen in a gypsy. You ain't met my Ron? Annoy and Clouds, grandson, yes, of course. Annoy and Clive, grandson, yes, of course. Ron been my son. Ron been away from home a long time. Yes, in England. Mr. Hold did tell you that. No, Ron did. You mean my other son yet, my Terence Ronald? No, not yet. Suddenly her moonlit face seemed infinitely sad. She held her arms close about her breasts, as though in grief. They took Ron away from me. They took him to Illyria, when him but a baby, for his own good. Everybody tell me that, but it'd be hard on a mother to lose a boy. My other son, he stayed back in the scrub with me. He is Zenneman. But never think, ma'am, that I would have held my Ron back. But it was, or never think, ma'am, that I would have held my Ron back. But it was hard, hard. The moonlight showed me that there were tears in her dark eyes, and one rolled down a fine high cheekbone. So, oh, Mrs. Rainier, ma'am, I didn't mean, I'm sorry. Suddenly her face cleared, and she laughed high and clear like a bell. Time for grieving is over. You and me is going to be friends, I can feel it. Lonely for you coming this way to a strange land and your man so far away. Bell know what loneliness is like. Lost my husband, lost my Jimmy, and then my baby Ron was taken from me. Bell knows what it what it's like to be lonely. Ever you need a friend, you call on Bell. Thank you. I was touched by her concern for me, and that it seemed to outweigh her own trouble. Her smile embraced me. Come, I got a gift for you. She held out a hand again, and I took it. She led me over the moon-drenched dune, past a giant palm, lifting dark wings against the sky, down a narrow path which ran between a tangle of vine. I could still hear the ocean, but I could no longer see it behind us. Where are we going? Just back of the creek. Creek runs into the scrub. Zenimans live in the scrub. She sighed. Zenimans, some good, some bad, like most everybody else, I guess. People say we no good because we live in the scrub. Because we black, because we different. Why different, no good? You coming? Yes. The path was so overgrown, narrow, and dark that I had begun to pull back. But Bill's last words had assured me. But Bill's last words had assured that I would follow her. My father had been very emphatic that no reason why. 
that there was no reason why other ways of living, ways we call primitive, should be considered less valid than our own just because they were different. It's, an, it's the old era, he told me, of equating equal la- of, of equating like and equal. So I let Bell take my hand again. Friends, Bell needs, fr- needs a friend. Bell gets lonely, Bell different, like my run. It's not easy to be different, Mrs. Rainier. The narrow path ended at a river. The water was so dark that the moonlight did not penetrate its surface. Trees with heavy gnarled trunks and great uncovered roots leaned over the darkness so that moonlight scarcely filtered through. And it was not until I heard a voice that I saw an ancient canoe at the water's edge. It was an old voice, and it came from what looked like a bundle of clothes in the canoe. You found her. Yes, Grandam. Told you she'd walk on the beach tonight. Told you she'd need to be alone. Bring her close. Want to see her. Mrs. Rainier, ma'am, Bell said. This is my grandmother. It make her right proud to meet you. She gave me a gentle push. I leaned over the canoe and looked into the wrinkled black face of an ancient woman. Though crone rather than woman was the word that came to mind. She peered at me with a small cackle. Whether of amusement or pleasure, I did not know. <laughs> Evening, Miss Rania. Good, e- good evening. The old woman looked past me to Belle. She'll do, won't she? Upon my word, I do think she'll do. Belle pressed her hand lightly onto my shoulder. The grand aunt be very hard to please. She likes you. The old woman held her hand out to me. I found her rather frightening, but didn't want to hurt her feelings. So I offered her my hand in return. She took it, but not to shake. Instead, she held it, palm up, moving it so that the moonlight, shafting through the trees, shone directly upon it. She peered and peered, nodding in satisfaction. Oh, I see. I see, oh, I see so much, so much, I will tell you. No, please. I tried to pull my hand away, but her bony old fingers held it in a tight grip. What's the matter, Miss Elenia? Don't you want me to tell you what I see? No, no, please. I was afraid of fortune tellers, inordinately afraid. I had had one experience in Oxford with a gypsy, an experience I would never forget. I tried to stem my panic to speak calmly. Please, I I really don't want to have my fortune told. I said, baby, she said cajolingly. You've got a wish about a baby right now, ain't you? And your wish is true. Her words filled me with happiness. But even so, I found that I did not want this old woman to know how much I wanted to bear Terry's child. I did not want her to, I did not want to hear it from her, and I did not want her to tell me anything else. Never knew your mother, poor little thing, she said. She too old for birthing. Pain and blood, very much blood, and a little baby, and then death. I felt Bell's reassuring hand on my shoulder. I felt Bell's reassuring hand on my shoulder. But that's not Mrs. Rainier, is it, Grandam? That's her mother. The old, woman, the, the old woman spoke slowly, deliberately, spacing her rhythmic words. Mrs. Rainier, going to be very old lady, very grand. But first, there be fire, there be blood and death, there be death. Grandam, what's wrong with you? Bill Zinnemann was respectfully reproving. You're frightening Mrs. Rainier. Didn't do nothing to frighten her. You didn't mean what you said, did you, Grandam? The bad things. The old lady cawed like an old crow. Could change it, maybe. If she be good. If she do what she told. Come on, Mrs. Rainier, ma'am, Bell said. We'll go back to the beach. When the grandam gets in a black mood, best to leave her be. Let Mrs. Rainier go, grandam. My hand was released. Bell helped me along the path. The sharp grasses cut at my feet. I realized that I was no longer carrying my shoes. Bell said as we climbed the dune, I'm sorry she got angered with you. You shouldn't have been frightened, ma'am. She just wanted to tell your fortune. But I don't want to have my fortune told. Belle was very full of apologies. She thought it would be a welcoming gift for me. She was so happy I had come. 
She wanted to give me something special. Her grandmother had the power of foretelling, and people came to her from all over. She was revered and respected. You ask Miss Irene, Bell said. Miss Irene come to the Grand Dam whenever she in need. I could only I could only say, but I'm not in need, Mrs. Zenneman. We were on the crest of the dune now. The ocean lay before us, the wide path of moonlight brilliant from the horizon to shore. Bell, her body seeming to move like a reed in the ocean breeze, looked out across the water. Mrs. Rainier, ma'am, it all my fault. It's not good to have the Grand Dame and angered at you. But Bell calm her down, Bell try. Quickly, she grasped my hand and turned it palm up in the moonlight. Against my will, she, I was compelled to look at her face, trying to read there what she saw in my palm, but her beautiful features were expressionless. Bell has the gift, too, she said, though not the big gift like Grandam, or like that why I took you, oh, Mrs. Rainier, ma'am. All Bella wanted was to offer you a little token of friendship. Again, in the moonlight, I could see the glint of tears. Don't worry. I withdrew my hand gently. I've lost my shoes somewhere. I don't remember whether I dropped them on the beach, or maybe it was on the path by the river. Shall we go back? No, no, I'll find them tomorrow in the daylight. I don't need them to walk along the beach. Bell will look. Bell will bring them if she finds them. We slithered down the, we slithered down the dune. Good night, Mrs. Zenneman, and thank you for being kind. Oh, ma'am, Mrs. Rainier, ma'am, her voice broke. It not fitting for you to call me Mrs. Zenneman. I'm Belle. In my heart, you be Stella, my friend. But Mrs. Rainier on my lips. Belle know her place and names. Belle know names be important. When my baby Ronnie went to Illyria, to Honoria and Clive, he took their names. James, Dr. James. Oh, that be wise, Mrs. Rainier, ma'am. Who go to a Dr. Zenneman? Dr. James, that be a fine-sounding name, but I ask myself in my heart, can my boy be that fine-sounding name? Who gonna tell my boy, or who gonna tell, who going to tell me? My other boy, my Tron, he a Zenneman. He don't change on me. But your husband, I started. Jimmy. In the Zenneman part of the scrub, once you be a Zenneman, that's what you always be. A man marry a woman, or a woman marry a man. Don't make no never mind. You marry a Zenderman, that's what you be. You all right now, Mrs. Rainier? They'll be looking for you in Illyria. I'm fine, sorry. I didn't mean to be silly about... Please apologize to your grandmother for me. Yes, ma'am. They're going to try. The farmer in the dell, the farmer in the dell. Hi-ho, the dairy oh, the farmer in the dell. The two piping, cracked voices came over the top of, the, of a dune, and Willie and Harris slid down the sand onto the beach. The mouse gets the cheese, the mouse gets the cheese. Hi ho, the terrio, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. And they landed at my feet, looking far more like children dressed as grown ups in their bell bottom trousers and red and blue neckerchiefs than the white haired adults they were. Bell pressed my hand quickly. Good night, Mrs. Rainier, my friend. Then she whispered, Mrs. Rainier, ma'am, be careful of the idiots. They won't harm you, but... Willie and Harry picked themselves up out of the sand, and Belle, with a quick glance at me, turned and went swiftly up the dune. Not nice to call us idiots, Willie said. Naughty lady, naughty, naughty. Harry shook his finger at the disappearing figure. Naughty lady going to be ashes, ashes, he chanted. Fall down, fall down, ashes, ashes. Willie shook his head. Zenimans, bad, bad. All Zenimans? I asked. Willie puckered up his little face, shaking his head. Not all, some good. Good night, my, good night, my dears, I said. I must go back to Illyria. Good night, Willie said. Good night, good night. Honoria and Clive. Harry reminded me anxiously. You promised, pretty lady, promised. I won't forget. I don't want Honoria or Clive to go anywhere either, but I don't think there's anything to worry about. Will you be all right? Boy's all right, Willie assured me. Good boy's all right, Harry added. They held up, they held up their nut-like faces. 
for good for my good night kiss. Very aware that I had been away from Illyria too long, I began to run down the beach. The damp sand felt glorious against my feet, and I concentrated on the physical pleasure in order to hush the wholly irrational fear that the gr- the old granddam had roused in me. Was I, I was carrying Terry's baby? Surely that ought to make me happy. Had I been a praying person, it would have been my prayer. As it was, it was my wish and desire. The light ship swept its secure and comforting finger across the sea. Ahead of me on the beach, coming toward me were two figures. And one of them started to run, leaving the other behind. The runner was Ron, Dr. Ron Jones. Dr. Ron James, he was furious. Mrs. Renier, you have upset, upset everybody. The great aunts are hysterical. Where have you been all this time? I'm a grown woman. I, I'm a grown woman. I needed to be alone, I said. For an hour and a half, the aunts are worried about you, and quite naturally. What's natural, about, <clears throat> what's natural about it? Or is there something I don't know that I ought to know? Ron's voice was cold and contr- Ron's voice was cold, controlled, the doctor's voice. Perhaps we are all, perhaps we aren't all as civilized around Eloria as you are in Oxford. Why what do you mean? There are some rough characters in San Felice. Not that there's any real danger yet, but we don't expect you to be we didn't expect you to be gone for so long, and we were afraid you might have been frightened. By what? Buzzards, he said bitterly. My grandmother has gone back to calm everybody down. I've lost my shoes, I said. He looked down at my feet. Your skirts are long enough. I doubt if anybody will not- if anyone will notice. Where did you leave your shoes? I'll go get them. I don't know. I don't remember when I dropped them. Somewhere on the beach, I suppose. I did not tell him about meeting his mother and going with her to the old crone. I was too angry, too guilty, too confused. I'll go look for them. Don't bother. I'll find them in the morning. I'm walking up the beach anyway, anyhow. Go on back to Aluria now, please, Mrs. Renier. Good night. He bowed. I returned the bow equally cool. Good night. Aluria loomed above me on the dunes like a house in a dream. Not only the house, the whole walk on the beach had had the quality of a dream, completely logical and realistic. Well, it's being, well it is being dreamed and yet incredible and foolish or frightening as, in the, as the case may be when one wakes up but the splintery wood of the ramp of Illyria was not a dream, nor the insects as I turned in from the ocean. Does one ever get stung by mosquitoes in dreams? Uncle Holdley was on the veranda waiting for me. Uncle Holdley, I'm terribly sorry. I walked farther than I realized, and dark did come more quickly than I'd expected. I'm sorry Ron and Clive had to come looking for me. Un- unlike Dr. Ron James, Uncle Holdley was gentle with me. I ought to scold you, but I think I understand. All of this, all of us, must be overwhelming to you. In the moonlight, he looked at me sharply. Are you all right, child? To be called child that to be called child that way again, to be called child that way again. I felt a wave of grief for my father, and I wanted to tell Uncle Holdley all about the horrible old granddam who had frightened me. But something, perhaps pride, prevented me. But I could ask him about the little men. Oh, the twins! I hope they didn't frighten you. No, they were sweet. Tragic about the twins. Uncle Holdley said, Their father was the captain of my father's boat. We used to spend long holidays on it when we were young. The captain's poor little wife died when the babies were born, and he almost went out of his mind with grief. We've always assumed responsibility for them. Their father served the family well, and it seemed the least we could do. The twins aren't a great deal older than I am. And I used to play with them sometimes when I was little. As a matter of fact, I love nothing better than to be allowed to spend a day with the twins. They were more fun to be with than anyone I knew. Except Sarah, of course, your husband's father. The only real friend I have ever had in my life. I wanted to reach out and touch him in a gesture of comfort, but his voice lightened. The twins play now exactly as they did when they were children. You'll be seeing something of them because they often come to Illyria to be fed, though they have their own little cottage we built for them. Ready for bed, my dear? Yes, thank you. Very ready. Around the house I could hear a wild cacophony of insects shrilling and churring. I might have expected this in Africa or India, 
I hadn't in my husband's home in the United States of America, I would have given a lot to be able to slap at my bare and itching ankles. The sky over the ocean was split by a blinding fork of lightning. I waited for the thunder, counting the seconds as my father had taught me to do when I was a little girl, to see how many miles away the storm was. But there was no answering crash. The wild electrical power that had opened the sky was beyond the reach of sound. Uncle Holdley held the screen door for me and we went into the living room. Aunt Olivia was seated at the piano, the old dog by her, his gaunt head on his knees, and Aunt Irene and Aunt Mary Desborough were at a small table in, the, in front of the fireplace playing backgammon. I made my apologies immediately, stopping their twittering before it really got started. Aunt Mary Desborough and Aunt Irene returned to their game. Aunt Olivia gave me a sharp look, started to say something, shook her head, smiled at me, and then held her hands out in front of her, working her arthritic fingers. I used to play well. It's terribly frustrating. Look, they're nothing but talons. Aunt Irene handed the, di the dice cup, ebony, set with mother of pearl, to Aunt Mary Desborough. Go on, Auntie, it's your turn. Age? Aunt Olivia, Aunt Olivia fondled Finbar's ears. I can't wear my rings anymore. They hurt. We turn back into animals when we grow old. Our beautiful human hands become claws. Our aristocratic noses turn to beaks or snouts. People shouldn't be humiliated by getting old and doddering in this undignified manner. I'd rather have died young like Pharaoh, your husband's father, Stella. Oh, everybody thought it was a dreadful thing for him to be cut down so young. But he's still and forever a young man and handsome and joyous and talented. Well, I... Well, I, but you see, when I remember Pharaoh, then I'm young, too, or rather, not my age at all. I'm, I'm me, Olivia, myself, not an old woman. How old are you, Stella? Nineteen. I looked away from Aunt Olivia to the Chinese vase filled with beech grasses which stood in the summer empty fireplace. There was a musty smell into the house, and the woven grass rug was prickly under my shameful bare feet. I hoped that Ron was right, and my skirts were long enough so that no one would notice. Aunt Irene and Uncle Holdley, not looking in the direction of my feet at all, bade me a courteous good night, and Aunt Irene shook the dice cup. My turn now, Auntie. Then out from under the sofa cushion peered the kitten. He looked at Aunt Irene and Uncle Holdley, at the old aunts, at Finbar, at me, and then jumped, landing, claws extended on my toes. I dug my fingernails into my palms, determined not to cry out and reveal my shame. I bent down and loosened the kitten from my sk and loose and loosened the kitten from my skirts and picked him up. Attack successfully completed. He began to purr loudly and patted my cheek with a sheathed paw, soft as velvet. Nobody I thought had seen. But Aunt Olivia put her hand up to her mouth to keep from laugh to keep from laughing. Oh Stella, I'm so glad you've come. At last, I've been granted a friend in my retreat. What's that? Aunt Mary Desborough looked up from the backgammon board. I didn't get it. Say again. I can't guess if you mumble. Maybe I, my ears aren't as sharp as they once were. My hearing is perfectly good. Say it again properly. But grant me still a friend in my retreat, whom I may whisper, solitude is sweet. I know it. I know it, Aunt Mary Desborough said. Obviously not, Shakespeare. Obviously. Oh, botheration, I give up. One of your obscure madmen, I suppose. Who is it? William Cowper. All right, Aunt Mary Densborough clucked in annoyance. Point for you, then. But I'm still ahead. However, Irene, I concede this game of backgammon. She rose. Good night, Livy. Good night, Stella. Good night, dear Holdley and Irene. See you in the morning. One hopes, Aunt Olivia whispered to me. One hopes... Not that Irene will see us, but that we will see Irene. That we will see. Aunt Mary Desborough paused the stair landing, holding her candle aloft, so that it made long, wavering shadows. Go to bed, Livy. I'm not playing any more this evening. Give up. I've won for the day. Does it? Aunt Olivia said. I thought we were brought up that ladies do not gloat. Go on, Stella Love. I'm unconsciously slow, and my room's down here. I can't manage stairs anymore. Good night, then, Aunt Olivia. See you in the morning, the old aunt said anxiously, as though it was it were a ritual. See, see you in the morning. 
I took my candle and went upstairs. And that is the end of chapter five.